So thank you very much for listening to this uh, Facebook Live uh, interview that's recorded. Um, I'm doing this because my recording device didn't work very well, so I apologize for not being direct with you, but um, I'm hoping to share with you what I would have shared with you anyway. So as many of you know, I'm a uh, research director of the Lyme Center at Columbia University Medical Center, and I've been working with Lyme disease for ages, and I have a particular interest in the chronic, chronic aspects of Lyme disease and why patients have chronic symptoms. Um, and as you know, uh, there are many reasons why people might have chronic symptoms and then how do you help people with chronic symptoms so we have both a research center and we have a second opinion uh service so the people come from around the country to um ask us are my symptoms due to lyme disease are they due to something else and if they are due to lyme disease or something else what can i do to help myself feel better so that's a wonderful challenge for any physician because it calls upon our, our training as in medicine and in neurology and psychiatry, and it requires a broad differential diagnosis. So that's something we enjoy doing. Uh, it takes a ton of time um, for us as well as for the patient. Uh, and uh, I do it along with my colleague, Dr. Shannon Delaney, who's a child psychiatrist and, and who loves uh, um, trying to figure out difficult problems. Um, so let me just go and tell you a little bit about the research studies that we're involved with right now. One of the most interesting things that's fascinated uh, me, as well as uh, many people throughout the country, as well as around the world, is disulfiram. Disulfiram is a very old medicine that first actually came in, uh, to the attention um, of a scientist way back in the late 1980s. And then uh, it, it rose again in prominence in the 1940s and 50s when it became clear that disulfiram had this very odd property of when, when people take it, uh, they smell of acetaldehyde, uh, number one, and if they're drinking, uh, they can have these terrible reactions to it. Now, in case you don't know what that reaction is like, you should know because it's very important. Many people listening to this um, talk might, right now might have an interest in taking disulfiram at some point, uh, and you should know what the consequences are of uh, drinking alcohol or being exposed to alcohol uh, while you're on disulfiram. And just to say a few words about that, there are many substances that contain alcohol. Um, mouthwashes contain alcohol. Deodorants contain alcohol. Uh, you might eat a sandwich at lunch that has wine vinegar in it, a small amount of alcohol. But if you're highly sensitive, you could have an alcohol disulfiram reaction. Now that's a normal reaction in a sense, um, so I wouldn't call it an adverse reaction because that's what's supposed to happen if you're taking disulfiram and you consume alcohol. Uh, it's used to help alcoholics not drink because it creates this tremendously adverse reaction in many people. So the reaction consists of, it could consist of something simple like headaches, a little bit of nausea, a lightheadedness. Um, if it's really bad, you can get wrenching abdominal pain, you can get wrenching chest pain, you can feel like your body is going into a convulsion. And if you have an underlying heart condition, you could have a heart, heart attack. Um, so for many, for what that's one reason why people with cardiac disorders should definitely not try disulfiram because it's so easily to inadvertently uh, be exposed to alcohol in, in, the, in the course of daily life. Um, so in our study that with disulfiram that we're doing right now, we exclude people who have significant uh, cardiac histories. We also exclude people who have um, a history of uh, hepatitis um, or other kinds of liver disease because alcohol, uh, because disulfiram itself is, can be sometimes toxic to the liver. In fact, about 20% of patients who take disulfiram uh, might have elevated liver enzymes. So we monitor the liver enzymes very closely and if, and if the liver enzymes get too high, we advise the person that they should come off of um, disulfiram. So I've told you something about the disulfiram alcohol reaction. Now what is disulfiram good for in addition to helping people not, um, not drink, helping them to not drink? Well, in the addiction side, it's also being studied as a potential treatment for people who abuse cocaine, because it seems to uh, uh, reduce the amount of craving that people have uh, for cocaine. So interestingly, 
uh, it's being studied and there's been a number of papers now reporting that it does have benefit in uh, helping to reduce cocaine craving. Uh, in addition, as many of you know, it's uh, being studied now and used uh, off-label as a treatment for patients with chronic symptoms uh, after standard treatment or prolonged treatment with antibiotics for Lyme disease. And it's been shown both at um, Stanford University as well as at Northeastern University that disulfiram is very potent at killing both the um, actively replicating Borrelia, the spirochete that causes Lyme disease, as well as the more quiet persisters. The quiet persisters are dormant, uh, relatively dormant spirochetes. And in the lab setting, it totally eradicates the uh, persisters as well as the regular spirochetes. So if one of the hypotheses we know as to why people might have Lyme disease is because of persistent Borrelia. So if the reason uh, the persisters are there is because they're not responding to doxycycline or amoxicillin, which don't kill these persisters, then you need to try something else. So one of the agents that turns out to be very potent, at least in vitro, is disulfiram. So now the question is, what if you do an animal model? So there was a publication that was printed in a, published in a preprint version in December from the Stanford group uh, reporting uh, beneficial effect of disulfiram in an animal model in killing Borrelia spirochetes and in reducing inflammation. So I don't think that has come out in a peer-reviewed journal yet, um, but I'm hoping it will soon. Um, and we're doing a study in humans to see if that's the case. Now our work is not the first to do this. Uh, we're the first to do a research study on it uh, clinically, but Dr. Kendall Ligner is actually the first to publish on it. And he has the most ex extensive experience of anybody, I think, in the world right now on the use of disulfiram uh, in a body of patients who have chronic persistent symptoms. And I've heard him talk. He's now treated over 70 patients with it. And he's reporting uh, very promising good results with it. I've known Dr. Ligner for a long time. I know he doesn't get excited by medications very easily. Uh, and uh, the fact that he is finding that patients are actually able to come off of their other antibiotics and eventually come off disulfiram is uh, very good news. So obviously, what you do in a research setting is very different from what you do in a clinical setting. When, you, when you're working with patients in the community, they're often on many different medications. They're often doing many different things at the same time. It's not a controlled setting. So in some ways, you don't know exactly what's doing what. You don't know what's causing the problems side effects and you don't know what's causing the benefit necessarily. So that's why you do need to do a controlled study. So right now we're comparing uh, a short period of time on disulfiram, four weeks to eight weeks, um, which again, that also is relatively short, just to see if uh, there's a difference between four weeks versus eight weeks. And we're starting at a low dose of the equivalent of about 125 milligrams a day and very slowly increasing if patients can tolerate it. Um, we're do, still doing the study, so if you're interested in, in um, joining the study, go to columbia-lime.org. Uh, we'd be delighted to have you join our study, even though this is COVID time, and obviously COVID is a time when people are quarantining. Um, we are still recruiting people for the study, and we're actually trying to convert it into a remote study so that we could do the study perhaps anywhere in the United States on a remote basis. So that would be very exciting if we're able to do that and actually help us to achieve our results of getting it done more quickly. We're also uh, very interested these days in Kundalini Yoga. Kundalini Yoga and regular meditation are enormously beneficial to the human being, I think. Um, it, there are many studies showing that they have a variety of healthy effects on the body, including just from an immunologic basis, uh, there's been some studies showing that meditation can reduce inflammation and, and reduce inflammatory markers. There have been studies showing that with HIV po positive patients that it can uh, enhance uh, immune cellular function. There's been some studies showing that, um, believe it or not, meditation may actually reduce biological cellular aging. Um, so these are fascinating things. Um, so meditation and yoga were studying. So we actually did a group therapy study of uh, kundalini yoga and compared it to a wait list control for people with chronic symptoms after Lyme disease. 
And I can't tell you the exact results because I know them and they haven't been published yet, but we're sending it out for publication soon, like probably in the next two weeks. But I can tell you the results look quite promising. Um, so I'm excited by that. And we're so excited by that that we're about to start a study looking at Kundalini Yoga versus uh, meditation versus cognitive behavioral therapy. Actually, everybody gets cognitive behavioral therapy, but then two thirds of the group get um, either Kundalini Yoga or meditation to reduce anxiety after COVID-19. Um, so I'm actually very excited about that. That's actually starting probably tomorrow or the next day or later this week. You can do it online anywhere in the country. Uh, if you go to proofpilot.com and you have heightened anxiety related to COVID-19 in any aspect, either because it's caused tremendous loss in your life or because of the financial uh, losses or because you're just worried about being infected as, mo as many people are and as we're going back to work, it obviously is a big concern. Um, and then after that, we're going to launch a study for Lyme patients in particular uh, using both meditation and kundalini yoga to see how it helps reduce uh, post-treatment Lyme symptoms on a much broader scale uh, than, than you can do in a group, group study. <clears throat> so I know that some people have written in uh, earlier asking some specific questions. And one question was, what can Lyme patients do to protect themselves and strengthen their immune systems? I just want to say very clearly that it's, the goal is not always to have the strongest immune system out there. Because if you have a super strong immune system, then you might have what's called a hyperimmune response. And as you know, COVID-19 is characterized by too strong of an immune response against uh, the uh, virus, um, a hyperinflammatory response. So we don't necessarily want to overstimulate the immune response. What you want, to, it wants is a balanced body. And that balanced body can be achieved through things like good nutrition, decreased alcohol, exercise, um, things like mind-body therapies, there are a number of them, but certainly meditation and, and yoga are among them. Um, another person asked about pregnancy during Lyme and COVID. Um, I think my Lyme infection is under control, and this was from Elise, uh, and my husband and I are thinking of starting a family in the next year. What can be done to prevent Lyme in utero transmission, and isn't it a bad time to think about this during COVID as well? So number one, I think people should go on and live their lives even in the time of COVID. Number two, all the studies that I know of related to Lyme disease uh, do not show an increased risk uh, in terms of transmission of Borrelia to in utero, to a fetus, for people who have previously had Lyme disease and got treated. So even if you still have symptoms, the likelihood is that you're not going to be transmitting anything to your uter to, to, to your fetus if you've been previously treated. Now, if you get infected during pregnant pregnancy, that's a very different story because oftentimes people aren't aware that they've been infected. And if they get infected during pregnancy, well, then the spirochete does pass through tissue, it can go into the bloodstream, and it could easily uh, cross uh, and affect, the, and affect the fetus. So that's, that's something you definitely want to pay attention to. You definitely want to get treated during pregnancy for. Um, but in this age of COVID, people are generally staying home anyway. So um, hopefully you won't get any tick bites. Um, and the third question had to do with question, a really important question is, is which are better, antibiotics, herbal, holistic treatments, combination treatment regimens, what's best? And I think that's from Amanda. And how do you know what's best for you? Well, that's a superb question. And I can't answer that, but I, what I can say is that um, we are in the process of trying to create a clinical trials network uh, for, uh, to conduct uh, na nationwide clinical trials in collaboration with investigators at other institutions um, to try to address some of these really important questions. And you can only address these questions if you have a large sample size and people willing to be randomly assigned to one of these let's say three options, combination treatment, herbal treatments, or antibiotics. That, those studies have never been done. They should be done. They need to be done. And uh, that's the kind of work that we love to do. So I think I'm running out of time. Um, let's see if there's anything else I can tell you that's uh, really interesting. We're starting a neuropsychiatry study of uh, children with Lyme disease because children have been inadequately studied. Um, and uh, we're particularly interested in the neuropsychiatric manifestations. We're interested in particular, for example, tick disorders, not ticks that transmit the Borrelia spirochete, but ticks as in, as in shoulder movements or eye blinks movements or, or spontaneous verbal productions. Those are all different kinds of 
movement disorders called tics. And there's some evidence that um, Borrelia infection may actually trigger a tic disorder just as it might trigger an OCD disorder. So we're actually going to, going to be starting a study most likely on that as well. So I think I will end now because I think my time is up and I thank you very much for your attention and I, and I advise you if you will and are interested in anything of what I said, please go to www.columbia-lime.org. And one more thing, uh, we will, we're sending in a publication soon um, on a nationwide study of every single person in Denmark for 22 years who have been studied uh, to look at what are the psychiatric manifestations after Lyme disease. I can't tell you the results, but I know them, and um, hopefully that will come out sometime in the next few months. So thank you so much for your attention. And finally, I just want to honor Neil Spector, who died recently, Dr. Neil Spector, who was a very famous oncologist and a beloved scientist in the uh, Lyme disease community because as you, many of you know, he developed cardiac complications from Lyme disease and had to have a heart trans transplant. And as a result of that, he became extremely committed to the Lyme disease cause and Lyme disease research and had started a number of really important projects. Uh, and unfortunately, he died last week. So I end on a sad note, but I also want to say that he was an example of uh, humanity at its best. Um, and if you want to learn more about Neil Spector, just Google Dr. Neil Spector. He's got a lot of number of wonderful videos, including one that was on uh, a Fox uh, with Lyme and Reason was, was the series that came out, I think, last year or the year before. So again, thanks for your attention. Take care, everybody. Stay healthy.